Good afternoon. Today is November 21st and just before Thanksgiving, and I'm so glad to introduce to you David Kinder, who has been very instrumental in, in bringing members to the Breakaway League, but more important, is a very important part of the professionals forum that will be happening in Nashville on November 28th, 29th, and March 1st. David, welcome, and I'm looking forward to having you be a part of the event that'll be here in 2024. Tell us a little bit about you, if you could. A little about me. Well, gee, there's a whole novel behind everything about me, but uh, if we're going to try to be specific here, let's just say that my career has not been the way I've always wanted it to be, especially getting started. And when I look back and I look at my motivations today, I really try to reach out to help out everybody I can because I wish I could be the mentor that other people need. I wish I could be the mentor that I needed myself. And one of the things that I've been very blessed with is the ability to make connections, especially within the industry, learn from them, bring people to them. Um, and so we can all benefit from that. And it's been an amazing ride. At the same time, there's been a lot of key things I've learned from many of them. And it's interesting how things play out. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I've got a narrative on all this. So here we go. This is, once it shows up, here we go. And this really, in part one, I'm going to talk about how events have shaped my career and how I, these events have helped me to serve my clients. So, all right, once the thing works, here we go. John Savage was one of the first people I started listening to. Now, John Savage passed away, I think it was in 93. Right. So I was, a, I was a freshman in high school. I therefore, I never knew, never knew him. Um, but John Savage, I've got a lot of recordings of him. He says this. I muted him for you. You're okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So John Savage said this. He says, we all drink from wells we didn't dig. All I am is a reflection of you people. He would talk about it in his meetings. He was yellow pad John. He's always there. He's asking questions of the other top people that he could so he could make sure he comes back. Uh, and this is what we're talking about, the Million Dollar Roundtable. Now, in 2007, this is December 2007, I joined a mutual life insurance agency. Now, I'm going to hide names to protect the guilty. But I had already spent three years as a junior investment broker at a credit union. And so at that time, I had my insurance license already. I had my Series 7 and my 66. And I just finished my CHFC designation. I would have thought that I would have been a, a, a person who could just take things and run with it. But I didn't understand life insurance. I certainly understood annuities. In fact, basically, if you ask me, what did you do with the credit union? I did mutual funds, mutual funds, mutual funds, which is re retail mutual funds. you got your American funds, Franklin Templeton. You've got your mutual funds in an insurance contract, which was variable annuities. And then you got your assets under management. That's what we did. And But I didn't understand life insurance. I'm like, why would anybody in the right mind buy this stuff? Or was it just a gimmick? Was it overhyped? I didn't know. So I thought I did due diligence and asked all the pertinent questions I needed before joining this particular agency, particularly as it related to prospecting. And when I got started with them, I had even partnered with the agency's number one agent, and I still didn't understand what I needed to know. Um, so I failed. I failed big, and it cost me my marriage. So I, I want everyone to understand that I've gone through some hell Granted, probably not as, as big of hell as other people have, but I've been through some hell on this. And if I could help someone to avoid some of that, just with a little bit of coaching and training, I live for that. And it's been amazing that over the past few years, I've had that impact on many people. It's been just fantastic. Um, so I asked myself, why do most agents quit? And I'm going to give something that I don't think too many people think about in the way I look at it is that. They quit because their other career plan that they had originally thought of, because no one grows up saying, I want to be an insurance agent, unless you happen to be a second or third generation agent. Um, unless it's in the family, you're not growing up thinking, I want to be an insurance agent. But they usually quit because their other career plan that they abandoned to become an agent, it's easier to make money there. And if you're struggling, you're thinking, and, and Tom, you say this all the time, if you're struggling, go open a Taco Bell, go flip burgers, go do something else because you're making money right now and it's going to ease the pain a little bit. But this career is a lot of work before it really pays out. And most people, and the way that companies recruit, 
I really can't stand it. They position it as a job and people make the decisions of, of getting started as though it's a job. They're not necessarily looking at it as a business or lifelong career decision or really an obsession. This is a whole different lifestyle. And most people, when they come into the industry, they don't see themselves as self-employed and that your professional development and training is your responsibility, which means that for things to change, it's my responsibility. Now, you, you wouldn't believe this, Tom, but I had the erroneous thought. Can't believe I thought this. Now I know better. All the training done at the Million Dollar Roundtable, I would have thought that all the company executives, everybody in charge of training, would be taking notes and try to bring all of that back to all their field forces so everybody get better and better and better. They don't do that. I can't believe that. They don't do it. They don't bring the best ideas that people are using right now and bring it to their field force. It's, it's, it's a shame. And how long has that been going? I mean, when I got started with that other company, and it's easy to say any company, you know, these companies are over 150 years old. You'd think that after 150 years, someone in the company would know how to sell this, their own product. If I had started with selling solar panels, the first thing that a solar panel company would do is say, here's our flagship solar panel. This is why it's the greatest value. This is why it's the most expensive. And everything else is a deviation from that. And it's so easy to understand. Life insurance? Huh. It's the most misunderstood, most uh, misquoted, and nobody understands it until you get around the right people. So um, here's the thing. Uh, I failed big, but if you wish to find, you must uh, search. And rarely does a good idea interrupt you. You know, I love Jim Rohn. I've heard this is a Jim Rohn stuff since I was 18. So, but in 2010, I was I was working at a uh, big box uh, appliance store uh, selling computers. They're out of business now. But I was working there, down and out, not figuring. And, and, and let's be honest, I probably had some depression at the time. And I had a day off and I was appointed with another company and they were doing a regional event. And I thought, well, I've been to some of these other events. Couldn't hurt. I could put on a suit. Let's go out there. Let's go see what happens. I probably won't get anything out of it, but it'd be nice to play insurance agent again and see if I might learn something. And the first half of that meeting was exactly as like that. You know, you get your wholesalers up. Here's our product. Here's how it's so great. Here's this definition. Bring this up to your clients because that's why they should buy this. You know, all this stuff that really doesn't matter. You know, here's your retirement plan wholesaler. That's the first half of the meeting. But then, Tom, you got up to speak. Now, I don't know if anybody else on this call knows anybody that gets younger as they get older, but that was Tom in 2010, okay? Um, and, and notice, there he is with the, with the overhead projector and transparencies. And I heard the at the time, the single greatest presentation on life insurance I'd ever heard at the, uh, to that point. Uh, and by the way, um, Jim Rohn used to say this. He used to say, I don't want the day to come when someone says, I, I, you know, you should have heard Jim Rohn 10 years ago when he was really terrific. He says, I want you to hear Jim Rohn now. You, you heard him 10 years ago. You should hear him now. He keeps up on everything. You need to hear Tom if you haven't, because uh, the presentation is different. It's more powerful, more impactful. But the main thing I learned from that one presentation, without even asking you any questions, Tom, was one, I don't need a stupid computer or illustrations to explain the power of and to sell life insurance. You don't need the computer. You don't need a six meeting process to sell large policies. Uh, people of modest means can afford large policies as long as they understand why it's in their best interest. And the fourth thing is, is don't miss meetings like this. You don't know what will happen. You don't know what you might learn. Can some meetings be a, a, a dud? Of course. But if you don't show up and actually have the opportunity, you don't know what you could be missing. Where would I be today if I didn't go to that meeting in 2010? It, it's almost impossible to calculate. So Jim Rohn said this, welcome all experiences. You never know which one will turn everything on. So, and here's the paradox of learning, which is really interesting. Stephen Covey taught that you need to commit to learning a subject well enough to teach it. And Jim Rohn taught us the ability to share, develop that ability of how to share things. Because when you share something, you, the listener, might hear it once. I get to hear it. 10 times or 20 times or 30 times, however many times I'm sharing it, it becomes far more ingrained in me than it does for the listener receiving it. 
And if you really want to master something, learn how to teach it and write about it. And that's what I've been doing. So I've got my blog. I began doing some webinars of my own. Um, I think the main thing is, is that I'm curious. So Jim Rohn said, kids are curious. Kids are watching ants while the adults are stepping on them. Uh, the more curious we are, the more we might be able to get out of things. Now, I was on the thing that you had with Van not too long ago, and he said, you know, you got to come to these things in person. And I, I will agree to that. But I also got to admit that when I go on Zoom meetings, I get a lot out of these too. But I think it's the way that, I, that I'm participating. I want everybody to notice, my camera's on. My camera is almost always on. It's rarely shut off unless... I'm taking care of something or I'm stepped away from the desk, which usually doesn't happen very often. I pay attention with my camera on, which shows that I'm holding myself accountable to the person who's doing the speaking because I want to make sure that they know I'm paying attention. But you never know what you might miss. Now, Tom, you did a boot camp back in 2019. This is the first one. This is 20 seconds, you guys. Now, I've got this recorded. So, of course, I've gone through this a few times. I need to make sure I share my sound. Otherwise, you all will miss this. This is 20 seconds out of his boot camp. Number seven is business. What is the value of your business? Would you like the business value to eventually end up in that circle where the distributions are exempt from tax? If the answer is yes, then I simply have to build the account now so that when we get to that point where you do retire, I have this set up to, set, to send money out to you. Imagine if you're barely paying attention and you miss that 20 seconds. Now, to me, that 20 <laughs> seconds was like, wow, there's more opportunities here. And I don't know what they all look like yet. But if you, unless you're going to events and you're listening and paying attention, you're going to miss stuff. And so when I, when I heard that, I'm like, there's opportunities. And I don't know what they look like. But here's the thing. I kept going to other events. So the next month, your son, Matt Love, was speaking here in Irvine. And... I was like, yeah, I got to see him. And of course, we're promoting this on the Facebook group. And of course, that means, hey, guys, come on in. You can meet me. We'll meet some other people. We'll have some fun. And so that company, they hold that event. But I didn't just meet all those people there in that picture. I met 46-year MDRT member, 20th year quarter of the table, 16-year top of the table producer, Kelly Smith. Now, I've heard of Kelly. I don't know what he did, but he happened to be there. So I asked, Kelly, what do you do? And you know that when we're in our industry, it, what people do, I want to hear the magic. What is the magic you bring to your client? And quite frankly, it was a little lost on me because he started talking about ESOPs. And I'm like, I'm thinking about ASOP fables, guys. I, I don't even know how to spell ESOP. I have no idea. But once he said that it could help a business owner to grow their business tax exempt and sell it on a tax exempt basis, legally bypassing the tax code. Well, utilizing it effectively and legally, of course. I'm like, because I was listening to Tom's boot camp before, my mind is attuned. Now I'm listening to other for other things. I'm like, I need to learn about this. But if I wasn't at that boot camp, I don't know if I would have even paid much attention to it. I would have thought, well, that's nice. That doesn't sound like my market. It sounds like it's above my head. But now I'm like, there's something I need to learn more about that. There's more to this because the next uh, couple of years later, I'm I'm doing my own events. I'm, and so I want to get the Facebook group going and I wanted more of our top people to be participating. I thought, let's see, who can I showcase? Who can I bring in and let people see their magic? What is it that they bring to the client? And so Kelly reached out to me. He said, you know what, David? Um, the Secure Act 2.0 has new ESOP opportunities. And here's the way he described it. He said, this is as good as asking a widow, how much life insurance would you like on your deceased spouse? Okay, you've got my attention. When do we want to do this? Do we do this sooner, later? You, know, you tell me. We did it about three weeks later. We spent two and a half hours on the thing. Now, way too long. But the neat thing was, was that I got to ask my questions. Because mm -hmm. I got to ask those questions. I think I brought clarity for everybody else that participated on that thing. I think I asked pretty good questions to make sure that I can understand. I'm a pretty bright guy, but at the same time, Sometimes things go over my head. I got to make sure I get it. Now, also Rich Coffin, he's the NAFA California membership chair. He was there on that call. Um, very helpful. But I took that video, two and a half hours, and I sliced and diced it. Uh, there's a couple of segments that were really good. One's like three minutes, the other one's six minutes. You know, 
just to kind of get to the point. And I sent them to Kelly. I said, Kelly, maybe you can use these for marketing, send them to your clients, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, it's really helpful that I'm not in their career agency system. So therefore, my compliance standards are very different. Um, I just make sure everything's accurate. I don't have to worry about company opinions. But Kelly asked me, he said, David, would you mind emailing all these links to someone he called the professor? The professor? <laughs> Who, that sounds really pretentious to me. Who would be calling themselves the professor? And it is okay. Professor Craig Hampton. And Professor Craig Hampton I'm going to give a full, a more generous and proper introduction of who he is and how he's, he's what I'm him. learning from him. He's but the professor, Tom, don't mute me. You hope mute the other one. Okay. Thank you. I'm to. Yes. <laughs> there we go. But the professor is very influential Thank in you. the insurance industry, and let's just say that he founded some of the early uh, uh, designs for private placement life insurance. And this was back over 30 years ago. I'll talk more about him on stage. But basically, because of attending events, I heard Tom speak in 2010. That forever changed my perspective. I attended an event, and then I met someone else in person who was also forever changing my perspective. I hosted my own events, and I'm learning firsthand from my guests, and I can ask him any question I want. Um, Charlie Tremendous Jones says, you'll be the same person in five years as you are today, except for the people you meet and the books you read. And John, Jim Rohn says, uh, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I'm spending a lot of time with a lot of quality people. And here's Brian Tracy. And I'm just going to summarize what he says, but your mind is your most precious asset. The quality of your thinking determines the quality of your sales career. You got to commit yourself to lifelong learning. And cannot emphasize this too often. Read. Listen to audio programs, attend seminars, and never forget that the most valuable asset you'll ever have is your mind. As you continue to learn, you'll eventually become the one of the most valuable salespeople in your company. And the more knowledgeable you, the more knowledge you acquire that can be applied to practical purposes, the greater your rewards, and the more you'll be paid. So I've name dropped a couple of people. I'm planning to name drop several more because I've learned different things from each one of them. And the question is, how do I put it together? It's a kind of a mosaic of training. What can I put together based on all of their input to help me help you understand a couple of ideas that might be helpful for you? So this is what I'm looking at to, to bring to, to the stage. The prospecting question that gets people to slow down long enough to actually listen and absorb what you're saying. And I have a 100% success rate every time that I ask that question. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying everybody accepts an appointment. I'm saying I have the, uh, they will all slow down and let me introduce myself. How the purpose and intent behind your questions can make all the difference. I learned that one from Van. Uh, the best mentality for handling objections. I learned that one because I was taught it in such a rude way that I had to create a different way to go, go about that. How to begin a discovery session. How you can incorporate asking for referrals without being upfront that being needy, greedy, or creepy. And I learned that from Sandy Chassel, also a speaker at the Professionals Forum. And I think he's going to be talking about that. So we're just going to be reinforcing each other here. And building your professional image. And that's been one thing that I've been focusing on a, a lot lately. You know, And it's we're not just talking about designations, although that's part of it. But it's being able to build up your image to such a way that you can stand out. And, of course, much more. I'm still editing this thing. But... Here's the thing is that I have this industry reputation of being the Google of insurance or the Wikipedia of insurance. Tom, you make fun of me all the time saying I'm a plethora of useless information. But whenever you ask me for a link, I have it. So it right. can't be that useless. Um, so when I'm there, ask me questions and be around other people asking questions. I might not be the expert you need, but I probably know who is. And if you get to listen to other people asking questions of the other speakers, that might trigger a question that you've been needing to ask. And so the, the, the synergy of all of us being in the same area, being the sa at the same time, is far more powerful than even reaching out one-on-one. -on -one. So those are my thoughts, Tom. I wanted to bring this, and that's what I was thinking about here. So, David, listen, you've been a, a, a um, instrumental piece in the success of what we're trying to do with the Breakaway League and 
the reason why I'm looking forward to having you be a part of the professionals forum. But I want you to answer this question. How will someone in the audience benefit in 2024 by hearing you talk? What do you think the biggest takeaway will be? Here, I, I, so Tom, here's, here's the problem with the question and no one said this for you, but it depends on what stage you're at and what you're learning and where you're, what problem you need to solve now. So that's the thing is that if I give a little bit of on each topic, the one thing's going to stand out far more for someone else than another thing. will. so, so for example, if someone's having trouble with objections, it's either going to be a mentality of what we're thinking about when we're being told an objection, or it's going to be how we're actually handling it. And it could be the mentality behind the words. I don't know. That's the problem. So I don't know where everybody's at, but if I have enough ideas behind one thing, someone can ask me later, say, Dave, you've mentioned this and I like that. Can you expound on that some more? And I'd be happy to. Plus, not only that, could I expound on it? I can send you the direction of where I learned it from and go, go directly to the source. So, for example, if, we, if someone has a real trouble with call reluctance, there's one coach, and that's Sid Walker. Sid Walker is the call reluctance prospecting coach. And it might be an intention in your mind of thinking that you have too much pressure on yourself, that your only objective of getting um, of making a call is to get an appointment. What if you change your objective? What if your, your objective now, instead of let's see if we get an appointment where you win or lose, what if your objective is, I want to introduce myself, I want to find out if it even makes sense for us to meet. Sometimes it just takes that little bit of a change of either thought process or our words. It's usually one or the other. I can't think of it being anything else. That that minor change can make a difference. But it depends on where you're at. And hopefully I can ad address enough of these areas where I have one thing that triggers someone that says, I need to know more about that. That's that's my thought on that, on that question, Tom. What I would like to do is, is open it up to the audience here. If anyone has a specific question they want to ask of David, um, unmute yourself if you would for me, please turn your camera on. And the question you're asking, I'm sure, is embedded in someone else's mind. So don't feel that you need to be cautious of, of sharing your question. Most people are thinking this exactly the same thing. So feel free, unmute yourself, turn your camera on, and please feel free to ask David the question. I'm such an open book, Tom. They, I, I think if, if they've heard of me before, they've probably already asked the question uh, in the past at some point. <laughs> so. sure. sure, exactly. And in this situation, they might feel some sort of uh, cautiousness because this might be published somewhere. But listen, the question you're about to ask, I'm sure, has been in everyone else's mind. So feel free to ask the question. Um, we are we are honored to have David be a part of the group. So unmute yourself, ask the question, turn your camera on, let's have some fun. Hi, David. Can you hear me? Hey, Gwen. Long time no talk. Yeah, long time. Well, I'll ask you a question. How do you get past the people that are still uh in the it's not the old buy term and invest the rest thing but that just believe that life insurance is not the way to go how do you i run into some very educated people how do you get past that objection so uh, i want to make sure i understand first and by the way that's part of it make sure you truly understand the person before responding um, but I'm not sure I fully understand. Are, are they saying that life insurance is life insurance? It's only for protection purposes. You're not supposed to use it as an asset class. Is that what we're trying to clarify? Uh, you no, know, most of them are saying that the stock market is better, that they, it'll always uh, in the end. I mean, there's a couple of them that have said that about life insurance. But in the end, what they've said is that, oh, the stock market's better. I can always do better long term in the stock market. But they're Perfect. also the last two I talked to that sort of had that were in their 50s. And so I'm like, well, you're going to invest a while then. OK, so it, it, again, this might be age based type of um, an idea here. But here's the thing. 
that I would do. And that's actually, I'm actually quoted, I'm going to throw this out there. Uh, Tom Hagna's new book, um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I'm quoted either for about five pages. And I talked, I talk about the fact that you can use life insurance as a non-correlated asset. And keep in mind, I recognize that's a jargon term. So a non-correlated asset means that it's not tied to the stock market as long as it's not a, a variable policy, right? And you can borrow against that policy when the market tanks. And you know, I'm, and I follow Van Miller. Van says, "Look, let's just wait until someone announces something from the government says we're going to stimulate the economy." Now you're not tracking the market; you're tracking the economy. Now imagine if you got a big old reserve that you could borrow against, put that at the down part of the market, watch it grow, keep it in there for over 12 months for long-term capital gain treatment, sell it off at the high, you know, however long it is, and make sure you pay it back. You get to keep the difference. So that's a way to, here's the thing, that that is a more active or tactical way of managing your finances rather than being passive. Let's do dollar cost averaging, market goes up, market goes down. I just put my set amount in the market every month. The problem with that is I believe that creates far more victims than winners. But if you take more hands-on approach, you can take charge of it and not be a victim of the stock market. You could take advantage of it by having a non-correlated asset. So that would be my thought to bring up to someone to have them say, it's not either or, to kind of quote Caleb Gilliam's book, it's and, can I invest in the market and have my life insurance? Can I do both? What would be the benefit to that? So that's what I would try to do. Don't make it an either or, make it an and. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks Gwen. So, David, how will someone in the audience benefit in 2024 at the Professionals Forum hear you talk? Where do you think the emphasis will be on your presentation? The emphasis, I believe, is elevating the basics. Um, but at the same time, changing some of our intentions behind why we do what we do. So here's a quick little preview. One of the things, and I learned this from Van, at least I think I learned it from Van, is that sometimes we ask questions to catch people. If you're, I used to think questions were a way to manipulate people to get what I want, which is the sale. And then to fuel into that kind of training mentality, it was whoever talks first loses. And uh, you know what? I've always had a problem with that. My job's to serve. Now, granted, there has to be some psychology in there to help people make their own decisions. But imagine if, you know, that's just one of the biggest ahas that I can help them make their own decisions. I'm the catalyst to help them make better decisions. I'm not going to make the decision for them, but I want to be the catalyst. I want to help guide their thinking. It's for their benefit, not mine. Uh, yes, I will benefit, but I want to make sure that if, if you're going to use the term, if some someone out there uses the term, if whoever talks first loses, no, whoever talks last, you both win. Make sure you're not the one that speaks first. You want you both to win. Um, you know, Stephen Covey talks, you know, think, win, win. That's habit, uh, I think that's habit six. Yeah, that's habit six. Think, win, win. That's just one area. So I, I, I wish I could say that there's just going to be one thing. Like there's so many different lessons that sometimes without being taught, we go to a different kind of default thinking. And that default thinking is whatever's the mainstream of sales training, which is usually garbage. But until we know how to elevate how to think and what to do differently, how are we going to make changes that we need to make? But it starts at the head, and then it starts out with, with the tactics that we use. So that that's what I'm thinking of. Well, David, one of the things we want to emphasize in the Okay, well, we'll uh... one of the things I want to emphasize in 2024 Professionals Forum is that we're going to have an opportunity to really have an to, to speak to all the speakers, to have 45 minutes at every break, to be able to ask questions and really reach out. Because one of the things that's going to separate this meeting from everything else that's out there in the industry is that the opportunity will present itself. 
that we're going to be able to meet with the presenters, ask them questions specific to the to the the industry, specific to the questions or the objections or the struggles that we are having as individuals in the in the profession. So what what do you think when you get to professionals forum in February, what do you think the biggest impact is going to be on you being able to be with everyone in the audience and be a present where you can be a resource for those people that are, that will attend. Uh, quite frankly, for me, it's it might feel a little bit like it was for the last one, the inaugural one. I was there. I got to meet so many of you because of the impact I've been able to have on di with different people based on the Facebook group. People are always asking their questions. We provide the answers, provide resources, and a lot of that I've. I, you know, I'll quote the, mo the most hated president lately, but it was a love fest in a way. Uh, so I'll quote that from him. Uh, it was so great. So the only thing that I'm not looking forward to is that if I have to be a separate from the other speakers, I won't get to talk to them. And that's what I like doing. I like to pick their brain myself. And I want to make sure I get to overhear your questions and who everybody else is asking, because but if anybody wants to ask me a question, the neat thing is, is that either I know the answer, I have an opinion, or I know who is the authority on those things. I'm not going to say I know it all, but I, I'm pretty well versed. And I generally know who does know the answers. Um, and, you know, again, I could give an opinion. And if it's my opinion, it should be yours, maybe. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But, you know, I'm an open book. I don't hold much of anything back. Well, David, as I said, I'm looking forward to having you be a, a part of the Professionals Forum in 2024. Looking forward to having you. I know you will be an, an asset to the people who will attend. Are there any other questions in the group that they would like to ask David at this time? If not, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to his presentation in the forum on February 28th, 29th, and March 1st of 2024. Any other questions that anyone would like to ask of David? Yeah, I, I got one. Uh, David, I, I, my question is, I am in year three of production, uh, total career switch. Um, I am planning on going to this uh, uh, event. What should I do to prepare myself to maximize uh, my, my time there? Beautiful question, David. Oh, that's beautiful. Um... To maximize your time, and we can think about this for any event that you might go to where you're looking for some, you'd have to look at your total process and ask yourself, what can I shore up? Where do I have any weak points? What do I wish I could do better with? Now, here's the problem, though, and I'm going to let you know, and we might call it a rabbit hole. But the thing is that once you affect one part of your process, you have to revisit everything else. You have to come, you know, go back and re-engineer everything. Uh, and that doesn't mean that that one way is the right way. It just means that you're going to get new information and you're going to incorporate it. You're going to kind of test it out in your mind. Does it feel right? It's kind of like putting on a suit. Does it feel right? Does it fit right? Does it fit me or not? But it might just take you down a journey on something. So the question might be like, well, is it your prospecting? Well, how are you prospecting marketing now? What is your message? Is it a generic message? Should it be far more refined to a specific niche or specific problems that you solve? Is it how you begin your fact find? I'll give you a, a tip for me is that the, the first meeting you have with a client is not about the first meeting. It's about the first meeting and the ongoing relationship. So how you begin that first session sets the precedent for the whole rest of it. So could that be need to be in, uh, improved? Um, asking for referrals. I hate asking for referrals out of the blue. So is there a way to bring that up up front so you can bring it up later? So I'm going to bring that part up myself. Um, you already know my opinion about computers. Uh, I share John Savage's opinion. Look, if your compass, if your internal compass says to use computers, go use them. So as long as I don't have to use them. Uh, so, you know, maybe you've got a, a software thing. One thing about software that I've found is that software brings out the analytical side of other people. And I don't necessarily want to deal with their analytics on the software that I didn't design. Let's ask better questions. Let me share different ideas. Um, when you're closing for the business, are you making the decision easy? Is the decision laid out well enough to be able to say, look, this is kind of a no-brainer. It's either A or B. 
which one do you want? You know, closing should be an opportunity. Granted, there's a little bit of psychology in closing, but our job is to get people to act, not just give them advice and be candy for the years. We want to make sure that people are actually taking charge and enacting what we know is good for them. The question is, do they know it's good for them? Um, so there's different aspects of the entire process that can be addressed. And then at the same time, what is your thinking behind each one of them? Uh, for objections, here, there's a sneak preview on this one. How you handle objections is a preview of what it will be like to work with you. So if you're very dismissive, uh, uh, dismissive of an objection and people aren't meeting with you, there's probably a reason why. So if we listen and we pause, and these are my favorite words, if I may, and then fill in the blank. Give them something new to consider. People will always make a decision, generally speaking, unless there's bad timing. It's one of my favorite things. Someone said, I'm not interested. I could appreciate that you're not interested. May I ask why? Is it just a bad time right now? Two questions right in a row. I'm telling them exactly why you shouldn't be interested. You have a bad time. Let's get together in three or six months. Um, so there's different things. So that was kind of a quick sketch of the things, of the ideas that I've got in mind, that maybe there's just one of those areas that once you tweak that one, it raises everything. So, oh. so Benny, if I if I could interject, one of the things we're going to change differently from 2024 to 2023 is this year we're going to have almost 45 minutes in each of the breaks that we're going to have during the morning and the afternoon. And we're doing this strategically so that we can have an opportunity for those people that we're going to attend to speak with someone like David or Van or Jim or Turner or me or whatever so that you can actually have one-on-one. -on -one. The difference between this event and every other event in the insurance industry is gonna be the opportunity for you to pull someone like David aside and say, David, here's where I am. Here's where I wanna go. What would you do to help me get there? And you're gonna have that opportunity with nine other presenters that are gonna be able to help you achieve what you want. So the professionals forum in 2024, the difference between that meeting and every other meeting that's out there in the industry is that you're going to have an opportunity to meet with these people one-on-one, -on -one, ask them personal questions and get personal answers on everything that, that's frustrating you, that's that's keeping you from achieving what you want. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to having people like David and everyone else on the speaker agenda to be able to share with every attendee those answers to questions everyone is asking, but doesn't have an opportunity to ask. When I started 50 years ago, guys like John Savage and Ben Feldman were impossible to get a hold of. There was no social in media, for example, where I could just get a hold of someone and ask them. And I went to an event and, and Ben Feldman had thousands of people around him. They weren't going to talk to me. So here in the professionals forum, we're going to have an opportunity to actually have breakfast, lunch, or dinner with them and, and, and spend some time with them. So every question you're asking, I'm sure is being asked by everyone who's going to potentially attend. And that's the difference between this year's forum and everyone else's. So I, I'm hoping you, you decide to, to attend because people like David are going to be available to you at, at, at 24 hours a day. For those two and a half days, we're going to be there in Nashville. So I'm hoping. Um, that I'm going to sleep sometime, Tom. I'm just letting you know there is a yeah. cutoff. Uh, <laughs> so right. it's not going to be 24 hours. <laughs> we don't know what that date or that time is going to be, but yes, I get it.